Okay, Jesus, are we ready? We're ready. Thumbs up. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this second issue briefing, the World Economic Forum on Africa 2016. My name is Oliver Kahn. I work in the media team here at the forum. Now, the whole purpose of the issue briefings is a format we've developed to hopefully tackle some of the tougher issues, some issues perhaps that are being left off the, the major programmatic sessions. Tougher issues, and we have a short amount of time to cover them, which means we encourage blunt talking, sharp interaction, hopefully a bit of, you know, a bit of good exchange, brisk exchange between you guys, our audience online, and the panel as well. This one, again, is on climate change. And my question, frankly, is why are we not talking more about it? Are we focusing too much on digital transformation? Are we focusing too much on productivity rises? Are we not looking at the elephants in the room? Are we sleepwalking into bigger problems ahead? Now, to join me on this session, I'm very pleased to be joined by Sandy Andelman, the Chief Scientist, Senior Vice President, Conservation International, and a real pioneer in data-driven measurements of climate change. I hope we'll have a, a, a good illustration of the, of the outlook, uh, both today and going forwards, from Sandy. Maktar Diop, Vice President for Africa, the World Bank, based in Washington, D.C., obviously has a very, very good economic overview and outlook on the challenge that climate change represents. I believe also has recently uh, produced research into how businesses can adapt and mitigate the risk. Finally, last but not least, Mamadou Bittier, Managing Director of the Africa Regional Office at Rockefeller Foundation, a, a key frontier investor taking risks where other sectors and other investment classes cannot do. And I'd love to hear, Mamadou, your thoughts on what we're doing, whether it's enough, whether it's too little. Mm -hmm. Sandy, please, first, over to you. Where are we at and why are we not talking more about climate change? Thanks very much. Well, in Africa, climate change is really the new normal. And the statistics are very scary. So here in Rwanda, on average, temperature has already increased 0.75 degrees per decade over the last 30 years. In Tanzania, uh, wet season rainfall in key maize area growing areas has decreased 40% over the last 30 years. In Ethiopia, pa pastoralist rangelands, uh, seasonal rainfall has decreased as much as 56%. The solution, a key part of the solution to this, has to be delivering the right data at the right scales at the right time. And much development is still based on untested assumptions and honestly wishful thinking. So in Tanzania, where, this, where maize production has declined and rainfall has declined, we can show that access to extension information, good information, can increase maize yield 40% in drought years, independent of soil type. And in flood years, wetter than average years, just good information alone can increase yield 25%. And yet, most farmers still don't have access to extension information. In Ethiopia, we're really talking about transforming pastoral livelihoods. But how do you transform pastoral livelihoods when two-thirds of women have no access to internet, TV, or radio, or newspaper? So delivering information at the right scales has got to be a priority. Thank you, Sandy. Maxa, what's what work have you been doing at the World Bank around this important issue? Climate change for us is central to our strategy in Africa, and uh, what we try to do uh, particularly is to make uh, adaptation central to the conversation. Uh, when we are move, uh, going towards uh, uh, COP21, there were a lot of discussion on mitigation, but very little discussion on adaptation, and it was very important to make sure that the, that agenda is not forgotten. So we developed uh, an action plan, a business plan, which shows um, you know, the overall cost was around $19 billion, uh, which was uh, helping uh, countries adapt to, the, to, to, to climate change, to uh, temperature rise, to uh, sea level rise, to, uh, 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 to uh, frequent 
extreme event like uh, El Nino. And uh, what we, 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 we will be doing is to, uh, is to work with the, with the country around some initiatives such as smart agriculture to make sure that we use uh, the technology available to our smart agriculture to work around the main sources of water in Africa, which are in West Africa, which are the, lake, the, the Niger River and the Lake Chad, which is under use threat. Uh, and for us, it's essential to really stop the, 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 the progress that has been made by having investment around the, the, those, those, um, uh, those uh, uh, natural resources that are available in, uh, in Africa. The second one is about the blue, blue, the blue economy. We don't talk a lot about it, but uh, coastal erosion is becoming a serious problem in Africa. We, for historical reasons, most of the capital city and most of the economic activity in Africa is on the coast. And we are seeing a very uh, 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 fast erosion. My own country, for instance, Senegal, uh, recently uh, the, the, the tourism sector was affected by the erosion that we saw on, on, on beaches. We didn't allow any more people to come and do some tourism. The World Bank has do to, to help and support countries to do that. The third element is on uh, everything which is on, uh, on uh, adaptation to, uh, to floods and uh, prevention of floods. So we've been working with the country around the Zimbizi, Zambezi uh, River where you have a, a cycle of drought and floods and which affect regularly country like Mozambique, country like uh, Zambia and so forth to have to create some early warning systems which allow country to uh, to 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 be, to be ready and but also to to insist that infrastructure are built to be resilient uh, to to these external shocks so this is the kind of things that we've been uh, doing on uh, on climate change lately uh, all these 19 billion uh, half of it uh, the 5.6 will be financed through ida resources and we are trying to mobilize resources from other partners or donors to be able to finance the rest of the, of the business plan, which is not. Uh, so this business plan was developed by countries based on the, uh, on the national uh, the NCD uh, program. And this was really homegrown uh, program. This is not something that we came and said to the countries, these are your priorities. It was based on the national programs that developed that we tried to consolidate in uh, one business plan and cost it so that we can mobilize resources from the international community. Max, I'm wondering how loudly your message is getting heard. You're asking for a lot of money, about another 75, 66% from, from partners. You're putting up a bit of money yourself, of course, but faced with so, much, so many investment priorities, is that our leaders around this, the, this region reacting? Do they see the scale of the challenge and are they rising to it? We, 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 we see some, uh, some interest. Actually, I think that you can have a win-win solution when you look at a productivity. And let me take the case of solar energy. Today, uh, because of technology uh, pro uh, uh, progress, we can have the kilowatt, of cent, the kilowatt of electricity uh, generated by solar around uh, uh, six cents a kilowatt, which is not something that was possible uh, uh, 20, uh, three years ago. You know, we are talking about 20, 22, on, uh, 22 to 19 cents. Today, uh, uh, we can have, even in countries which are small scale uh, solar, around 10 to 12 uh, cents a kilowatt, which is much lower than most of the country's uh, production of, of solar. So, so it's possibility today to leapfrog. Just think about it. A country, a long -long country like, uh, like Chad, like uh, Niger, would have never dreamed to be able to have access to electricity, would be able to have electricity, clean electricity in, in the country, and therefore increase their productivity while protecting the env environment. So we have, we, we have a win-win, and I think that moving forward, uh, my, my suggestion is try to, to show the win-win the solutions that we can have to make sure that people don't see uh, uh, productivity growth and, uh, and, uh, and uh, 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 productive environment as being orthogonal, but as some things that we can do together. And that some points like uh, smart agriculture, like, uh, like uh, 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 solar energy, like coastal erosion, where we can have this coalition. And, 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 and lastly, uh, tell more of the good stories is coming from Africa. When we talk about uh, protection of the forest and the biodiversity, we think about Costa Rica. Okay. We, we don't talk about Gabon. But Gabon has done the same. Yes. Gabon has been protected, the, the, the forest, and uh, nobody talk about it. We talk only about Costa Rica. So tell the good story when it's happening in Africa. It's also part of mobilizing people and, uh, around this. And lastly, make the financing mechanism that are existing much more accessible, much easier to, to mobilize. The Green Fund 
and other uh, type of instruments should be much easier and much more agile so that we can uh, tap that money and mobilize it because there is commitment of the international community to finance it. Commitment from the international community is it's encouraging to hear. Maybe we'll talk about business a, a little bit later. Okay, so we've gone from an information deficit to an investment deficit. Mamadou Bite from Rockefeller, you're a frontier investor. We just talked about that. What are, what, what are you seeing? What, what are you seeing on the ground when you talk to business leaders and, and, and political leaders? Well, let me first say that uh, uh, for the Rockefeller Foundation, we really recognise uh, the role of climate that climate change uh, plays uh, in depleting development efforts, and uh, we have then chosen uh, to make uh, resilience as one of our key focus areas. Uh, 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 res building resilience to climate change and to other uh, vulnerabilities uh, and the ability to bounce back uh, uh, stronger and be stronger is uh, one of our dual goals uh, together with building e inclusive economies. We see also as a philanthropic organization uh, that our role can be really to put our risk uh, philanthropic dollars into really pioneering uh, solutions uh, that can be taken and scaled and applied to specific situations. Uh, some of these are uh, uh, solutions that can be applied globally. Uh, some of these are also very specific uh, to, to, to specific areas. And some of these examples uh, where we have really invested uh, recently, uh, are some of these are like uh, rebuild by design. Uh, which is a program that has been uh, 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 conceived after the superstorm Sandy uh, hit uh, the United States, uh, where we created a unique competition that raised awareness and inspired public participation to transform the way disaster recovery efforts are designed, funded, and implemented across the United States. So uh, this was a challenge uh, from uh, 148 uh, international applicants, uh, 10 uh, inter interdisciplinary teams uh, were, were, were selected. And with uh, the foundation's $3 million investment to design this uh, and come up with the solution, we're able to leverage uh, nearly a billion dollars uh, from federal recovery funds uh, to address that. Other examples are uh, 100 resilient cities, uh, because also uh, cities uh, just as uh, uh, Mr. Job just said, uh, in fragile ecosystems uh, and along coasts, uh, the impact of climate change can be very catastrophic. Uh, coastal flooding could produce damages costing over $1 trillion a year by 2050. So this is why also we launched 100 Resilient Cities, which is a platform by which 100 cities are selected globally uh, to really uh, be in a platform uh, to uh, uh, have a paradigm shift how we look at city uh, development, uh, not just uh, in a traditional way, but really looking at it uh, from a uh, resilience building perspective. Uh, and uh, 67 cities have so far uh, been uh, selected uh, and instituting uh, uh, one of the benefits is really how we are raising awareness of the needs of building resilience. How a city needs to have, for instance, a chief resilience officer like it would have a chief of police or, 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 or another official to be ingrained and institutionalized. Uh, for Africa in general also, uh, we have a climate smart rural development. Uh, uh, rural development that we've launched, which have actually gener which was uh, mainly designed to help countries, research, uh, governments, and others build their capacity to addressing the vulnerabilities to climate change. This has generated innovations in the field, such as uh, the African Risk Capacity uh, today, which is a pooled uh, risk uh, agency, a uh, specialized agency of the African Union today, uh, which using a uh, uh, a software, Africa Risk Review, can uh, use uh, data, uh, uh, weather-related data, to provide insurance uh, to countries, and thereby not only uh, give them access uh, when a disaster uh, comes, to access the resources for immediate response, but also, more importantly, uh, take them through a journey uh, during which, actually, they develop contingency plans. 
uh, which also will help them once resources come, not just relying on international community, but be having the ability to respond through that. And uh, finally, I want to uh, also talk about uh, um, uh, the Global Resilience Partnership, which is also uh, bringing together the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, 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 USAID, and uh, the Swedish International Development Agency. Uh, with an investment of $50 million each, actually to design and surface solutions in Africa, the Sahel, in the Horn of and Eastern Africa, in the Southeast Asia, local solutions uh, to address uh, the biggest challenges and threats, vulnerabilities to, to, to climate change. So if you wish, uh, we see our role also of building data. We are very proud actually to have supported the development of the atlas which will provide data that can be accessible uh, to the to the world community analyzed to design a very specific very precise intervention that will help address this issue so uh, this is uh, what we see so our role is pioneering but our uh, expectation is that also platforms like this can help form those partnerships that takes these working solutions and uh, scaling them uh, so that they can help the global community address these issues. I can see Sunny has a comment, but at this point, I, I, if I may, I'll pause first. You see, see, see who wants to ask a question. Let's see a, a brief show of hands. The gentleman over there, anyone else for now? We'll try to take a couple if we can. Okay, gentlemen, sir, let's start with you. Hi there, I'm John Duncan from Old Mutual Investment Group. I'm kind of curious to hear from the panel. I mean, aren't we kidding ourselves on some level? I mean, when you look at um, sort of global carbon projections in the, in the emerging market economy, actually what we're talking about is an increase in absolute terms in carbon emissions over the next 30 years. And, you know, while, while we, and I, I just worry that, you know, we talk about climate change, but actually we're not really addressing the real reality that a lot of African countries are going to be consistently putting capital into basically fossil fuel reserves over the next, you know, while. It's a good point. We've seen development paths in, in Asia which have been proved unsustainable and Africa has a golden opportunity to get development right and, and conserve as well as, as, as well as grow. But, but is it actually going to happen? Are we sleepwalking yeah. into this? Are we still focusing on old traditional models of growth which are going to be potentially disastrous? Yeah. I would like to address this point particularly. I mean, this is exactly what we can do and we have to do and which is starting to happen. Uh, when I took this job four years ago, some people were saying that in you, you cannot build a dam which is higher than 10 meters in Africa. Okay, that's what was, was, was told. And I would say, strange because half of the world has built dams, actually. Europe, Asia, America. Uh, I don't understand why Africa cannot build dams. And if you want to provide electricity, which, which as you said, allow uh, women to access basic services, uh, health services, we need to have electricity which is cheap, and the cheapest one is hydro and Africa has a ton of hydro. So today we have in, uh, big investment in, in hydro, Swapiti, Keleta, uh, Lompanga in, in Cameroon. And uh, we don't know what will happen with Inga, but if Inga happens, it can provide a lot of clean energy to, to, to basically uh, a, a large part of Africa. So I don't, I don't think that Africa, actually what I have been saying repeatedly is that Africa can have his, his energy revolution being a green revolution. We have the potential. The potential that we have today in geothermal, in wind en energy, in solar energy, in hydro, there is no reason you can have a very uh, kind of diverse uh, energy matrix in, in Africa, which is totally uh, 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 green. Uh, uh. So, so it's just a matter of, of, of getting, uh, getting all the instruments of uh, mobilizing all the resources mm. from the private sector to do that. And it's happening. People in the private sector are investing in IPPs, in solar, mm -hmm. in IPPs, in, uh, in geothermal, in IPPs, in, uh, in hydro. So it's just a matter of mobilizing. What I think is that the money could come from and a coalition like that can help build. We have a pension fund and insurance fund which are sitting on a huge amount of money and uh, why they're investing it in places where they have a return which are pretty low. So if we manage to find a mechanism to de-risk some of this investment, there is a proposition here to mobilize these very long assets, the long resources to invest it in green, green energy, 
and be able to do two things, help the, the retirees in uh, Europe and in OECD country get better return in their pension fund. At the same time, we could do, do, do excellent things, which is provide green electricity and clean electricity to, 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 to the poorest in the world. So I, I'm not taking it as a fatality. We can change it. And it's happening just a matter of strengthening that coalition and make it much more uh, resilient yeah. to, to shocks. Yeah. Okay. So please put your hands up if you have any questions. Otherwise, I'm just going to go straight ahead. Sandy, uh, do, you, do you share this optimism? The, the businesses that you talk to are in talking the same language when it comes to preparing for green growth, or do you think that's slightly naive at the moment? I do share the optimism. And one of the reasons, so as Mamadou said, he invested, um, and basically the Rockefeller Foundation challenged Conservation International to synthesize and integrate existing data to see what new insights could we get into many aspects of investment. So natural capital, financial capital, human, social, manufactured capital. And so in six months, we were able to fuse about 15 terabytes of data. And with respect to your uh, comment, Mukhtar, about needing more good stories from Africa, what the Atlas does, it's created a platform for data-driven storytelling. So if you go to the Atlas, it looks like you're looking at slides and maps and photos, but actually those change dynamically as the data, new data, are being pulled in. And already the Global Environment Facility, the government of Ethiopia, um, a total of 12 countries in Africa have already started to use the Atlas as a tool for risk assessment and evaluating assumptions before they make investments. And it's, it's great to see willingness and, and, and responsibility and, and, and a, a bigger picture viewpoint from business, but that's larger, larger businesses. What about smallholder farmers who are struggling to increase the yields in their crops and have little money to invest in, in the long term? the bulk of our African agriculture, to be frank. What are we doing there, and is it enough? OK, uh, one of the things I can say is that uh, uh, one aspect, uh, particularly around uh, agriculture, is uh, how we can uh, build also the resilience of uh, smallholder farmers. And one part of it is how are we ensuring, as a community, that uh, most of what we produce is not going to waste with the impact Implications from an environmental point of view. Uh, uh, we know, and uh, uh, many might be very surprised to hear this, but actually the continent produces more than it needs. Uh, the continent produces about 130% of its food needs, but 60% of that is lost because most of investment goes into increasing uh, productivity and production, which is important. But uh, uh, improve, um, uh, in, in investing also in the other side on how we are making sure that we are not losing all we produce with all the environmental implications because we know that about 25% uh, of global fresh water and 20% uh, of global farmland are used uh, to grow crops that never gets to be eaten. So by in, in, in investing in a better handling of post-harvest management, then not only the impact from an environmental point of view is important, the impact from a health point of view and nutritional is important, but also the impact from an economic point of view uh, in terms of increasing farmer income to actually invest in their own resilience is also very important. So that's not the only way, but this is also one of important ways in which Maybe with one stone we can kill many birds. Last chance for any questions. Sir, please, we just wait for the microphone. If you could let us know where you are or from and your name. Yeah, I'm also from Old Mutual. Um, uh, Paul Boynton, just uh, maybe the panelists, what do they see as the biggest challenge in this space? What is the most difficult issue going forward that uh, confronts us that we need to, to solve? 
Um, I'm hearing that we're solving a lot of problems, which is wonderful, but I'm concerned that there are some issues out there which are difficult, perhaps, and maybe we could just highlight what some of them might be. There, there have to be roadblocks ahead. Like, Sandy, let's start with you on this one. I see two challenges. One is being able to rapidly scale up solutions that work. Um, it's happening too slowly right now. Um, the second thing is um, really providing access to capital and financing that enables innovation of whether you're talking about smallholder farmers yes. or urban or peri-urban communities. There's lots of innovation out there, but we need to make the financing and the capital available more easily. Yeah, I would say two, two obstacles, I, I fully agree with you, uh, at scaling up. One of them also is uh, the use of the existing technology. Mm. If you take agriculture, if you go to the CGIAR uh, uh, network, and you look at their website, there's a technology for a lot of things which could help having a smart agriculture. The so question is that it's not adop uh, adapted. adopted. So do a better job to, 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 to have a better adaptation by the, by the farmers of all this technology which is available, you can hel help having them a smart agriculture. That's, that's a big question. And uh, institutions, agriculture, se agriculture sector in Africa are not strong enough to have a fast absorption of the technology and make it available to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the farmer. Secondly, the financing the public goods that, uh, aspect is more complicated. It's easier to convince a country to get some electricity uh, which is clean. It's more complicated to find a coordination uh, uh, mechanism so that people protect the coast. Uh, uh, scientists tell us that co uh, protecting a portion of a coast doesn't solve the problem because the current just moves to another part of the coast and the damage is even uh, uh, bigger. So they tell, they tell you that you need to do it on a very, all, of, all, all along the, the coast of West Africa. So having a coordination mechanism to finance important investment like that is also a, 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 a challenge. Lastly, is uh, when there is a differential of cost uh, between some technology which are polluting and, and clean technology, uh, have a much faster and easier mechanism to access the resources to offset, offset that differential. It's still a bit cumbersome and complicated for countries because there are various sources of financing and they are very vertical. They address forests, they address the coast, they address one issue and countries are telling us, like Rwanda, I want to have something to finance my overall, my holistic plan of climate change a, a plan and we don't have yet the, the proper instrument to, add to, uh, to, to, do, to do that. Mamadou, uh, your challenge. One, one thing I will add is uh, actually uh, new solutions and working differently in uh, new situations is important. We need to be able to reinvent ourselves. But I think also it is important uh, to look at good instruments that we have engendered and how do we support them to work. The example I'm going to give is I believe that climate change has uh, received more clout recently. But some regions have been experiencing it for a longer time. I'm just thinking about the long droughts in the Sahel in the 70s. And I believe that uh, the West African community came up with solutions. Uh, for instance, by creating three institutions. The SILS, uh, policy, uh, 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 supposed to coordinate policy efforts uh, among the Sahel countries, the Centre Agreement to provide uh, uh, meteorological information, and uh, l'Institut du Sahel, uh, uh, which was also to do research. So uh, that's in the 70s. Great approaches. Obviously, it was not just enough. But the way we support research we support access to information, that we have the right policies and implement them and support those institutions, like the governance of all of it, uh, seems to me also like very important. And uh, this is something I think that in addition to everything that was, that was said and which I agree with, uh, actually is also an important approach. So before we just wrap up, um, Mamadou, you're in a pri privileged position of investing in exciting 
ventures, solutions? What's the most single most exciting idea, proposal you've been confronted with in, uh, in, in, in the past year, let's say? Sorry, can you say it again? Yes, what, what's the single most exciting solution that you've been confronted with There's a, uh, an investment opportunity for you to fund? Uh, well, actually, uh, there are uh, uh, many, depending on whether we are talking about urban resilience. Just one. We have, we're running we out of time. The most on exciting one you've seen. Uh, one uh, of uh, them is really about insurance, uh, and particularly for smallholder farmers. Uh, and uh, this is called R4, and which is coming from really a challenge we saw in uh, the Tigray region in Ethiopia, and in partnership with WFP, Oxfam, and Swiss Re, come up with uh, micro insurance uh, for the most vulnerable smallholder farmers. Whereby, actually, with the innovation of work for insurance, we were able to address the issue of the challenge that these smallholder farmers had to actually pay a premium. And this has actually helped uh, uh, these smallholder farmers in times of uh, challenges to be able to access payments uh, uh, that allow them to protect their livelihoods. That, for me, is also something that needs to be scaled beyond, and is being uh, uh, right now as well in other countries. Thanks. So we're already running out of time. But I, before we do end, I would just like to help, help summarize this session by asking each of you, we all have a good level of optimism, which is good. We're, we're, we're a positive, optimistic bunch of people. We believe in the power of collaboration to solve critical challenges. This is a very good thing. So I'm going to ask each of you what your, what your, um, what your realistic scenario is for, for how much progress we're making and what climate change means to Africa, given that, as Sandy says, climate change is the new normal. What can we realistically expect? I think um, what, what's needed and what we're really beginning to see is these kinds of holistic system solutions like here in Rwanda, the Global Resilience Partnership, many examples because we are not going to solve climate change problems without breaking down silos and really having partnerships across sectors, across government, private sector, civil society. And I see that now starting to happen. Right, sir. Yeah, I'm very encouraged because uh, moving to COP22, what I'm hearing is that people want it to be an implementation COP. Mm -hmm. People want to say, uh, uh, the leader I've heard, they say, okay, it was a good meeting in Paris, COP21, a lot of commitment have been made. We want to make sure that in COP22, we can sit and say what have been done in, in, in between. And I think that uh, as we, uh, we uh, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a sea change in the way we are moving in, the, in things now. And uh, uh, more accountability in con commitments that will be taken will be uh, something which will help us uh, build our, our optimism. And if we are not be able to have an instrument of accountability on the commitment, we will not be able to, to have that, 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 opportunity, that uh, 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 optimism. So I'm very optimistic, but uh, the proof is in the pudding. Let's Absolutely. see what will happen in, in, in Marrakesh. Ma Mamadi, what does optimism look like to you? Uh, for me, it's uh, also the greater, uh, as uh, was said, commitment, but also looking at not just reaction, but how we prevent, uh, for instance, by bringing those solutions. For instance, uh, the Global Resilience Partnership is looking really about how are we not losing development gains uh, uh, through lack of preparedness, lack of building resilience. And I think that uh, that approach applied to all of the dimensions of climate change issues, uh, for me, uh, is a source of uh, great optimism. Well, it's, uh, it's been a fascinating discussion. It's always too short, I find. But there's a lot riding on this optimism, so I wish you the very best of luck in implementing and making sure it happens. Thank you all very much for joining us here on this panel. Thank you for joining us here in the room and also watch those watching us live online on weforum.org. This session is now finished. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.